Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we have a panel discussion uh, here. The topic is Federal Linux is a digital public good, now what? And um, originally, there were supposed to be three speakers here. Unfortunately, as you all know, Matthew Miller is sick, so let's hope that he gets, gets better soon. But we have two other speakers here. So we have Justin, Justin Flory and Lucy Harris. Um, Justin Flory is uh, a humanitarian open source developer at UNICEF. And Lucy Harris uh, is a co-lead of the Digital Public Good, Goods Alliance. So the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, well, it's too bad that we couldn't get Matthew on today, but I know he wanted to be here and looking at his Twitter, uh, he really wanted to be here physically too, but uh, I'm glad that you all could be here and make it. So maybe Lucy, you want to do maybe just a quick, quick intro before we jump into some of the panel discussion? Absolutely. Uh, hi, my name is Lucy Harris. I'm based in Toronto, Canada, and I co-lead the Digital Public Goods Alliance, which is a multi-stakeholder initiative founded by UNICEF, the government of Norway, the government of Sierra Leone, and the Indian think tank iSpirit, and we're dedicated to advancing digital public goods to achieve the sustainable development goals. And I'm Justin. Uh, I've been uh, involved in the Fedora project community for a little over six or seven years. Uh, currently, I work at UNICEF with their Office of Innovation as an open source advisor, where I work with different startup companies and, and teams building open source solutions to help them uh, think through best practices and how to build communities around their work. And today we're here to talk a little bit about uh, a story uh, happened a little bit, a couple months back in 2021 of how Fedora Linux became the first Linux distribution, Linux distribution to be certified as a digital public good. So across this panel, we're going to, uh, we're keeping it pretty informal and we'll try to leave some time towards the end for questions, but we'll take you through a little bit of background on what digital public goods are all about, what they are, who's behind them. We'll talk about the pathway that Fedora took uh, back in August to become uh, a, one of the first certified Linux distributions. And then we'll try to connect this into why this all matters for Fedora and some things that you can do uh, to nominate some of your own favorite open source projects as well. Uh, do you want to try the screen share, Lucy? Yeah. Or do you want to start with that? or? Yes work. How's that? Perfect. Wonderful. Uh, so yeah, I'll really try and focus on kind of what are digital public goods? Why are they important? And then hand it back to Justin to talk specifically about uh, Fedora Linux's story. But I'd like to start uh, with a different story that I think is important, kind of set the scene of why DPGs are so important. So in, uh, this story starts in Sri Lanka, where the first suspected case of COVID-19 which was registered on January 27th. And realizing that travelers were still pouring into the countries as a popular tourist destination, they immediately, local developers, got to work building this COVID-19 tracker. So this tool focused on the registration and tracking of travelers who are arriving from regions with a very high risk of COVID infection. And in just two days of that first case being registered, Thanks to this local development team, uh, this tracker was deployed in airports. And the reason this was so successful wasn't just that they uh, were building this tracker on its own, but because it was being built on top of another open source project called DHIS2, which is an open source health information management system and a digital public good that was already in use in Sri Lanka. So the speed and efficiency with which they were able to respond to this crisis is impressive, but it's not the most impressive part of the story. What I think makes this story interesting is that when, because DHIS2 as a digital public good was already being used in countries around the world, when Sri Lanka shared their user guide about their tracker with the global community, other countries were able to pick it up immediately and it was implemented in 38 countries and is currently being adapted for use in 14 more. So why this is cool is because it's not just a great piece of technology, it was something more. It was built as an open source project that meant it could be modified. And when the problem was spotted uh, that no one could have predicted this global pandemic, they were able to adapt it to fit a new circumstance. Then they were able to share it back with a global community of others who were using and building that solution 
to solve that problem, same problem for dozens of other countries and communities. So I think the folks here would agree that though technology itself doesn't solve societal problems, we can solve them using technology and that the way that technology is designed and developed really matters. So this isn't a new idea that the way technology is designed matters, but there's been a growing focus on this idea uh, that is emerging into what we call digital public goods. And I think it's largely driven by a recognition that this, the process of digital transformation that has just been electrified by COVID-19 needs to be effective and adoptable and needs to be based on open tools. So this is a definition from uh, that came out of the 2019 high-level panel on digital cooperation, where the UN Secretary General uh, gave this definition of digital public goods as digital solutions that promote open source software, their open source software, open data, open AI models, open standards, and open content that adheres to privacy and other applicable international and domestic laws and does no harm. So we at the Digital Public Goods Alliance uh, took this idea and really fleshed it into a definition of digital public goods. So DPGs are technologies that really harness the power of the internet to create thoughtfully developed digital solutions that deliver a shared benefit and solve common problems. Sometimes uh, people think of DPGs as just being free software, but there's so much more than that. When we talk about digital public goods, we're talking about a solution that advances the sustainable development goals that is open source, yes, but that has also taken steps in its design and development to avoid and mitigate harm. Fedora Linux, which Justin will be talking about in a moment, is a great example of this, built collaboratively, collaboratively available to anyone to change and modify, and presenting a solution to a common problem. So to make this even more functional as a definition, to get really into the nitty gritty of what is a digital public good, we've established this uh, digital public good standard. This is a summary of it. You can see the full standard on the website, but there are nine indicators that serve as like a baseline of requirements that have to be met in order for to be considered a digital public goods. So you can see that includes things like having documentation, uh, use of an approved open license, mechanisms for extracting non-PII data, um, and number nine that just says, do no harm, folds out into a whole bunch of 9A, 9B, 9C. It's much more complicated than I could fit on this one slide. So solutions can test themselves against this uh, and submit to the DPG registry to be reviewed as a digital public good. And of course, with the ethos of open source, the DPG standard itself is an open source project. It lives on GitHub. Anyone can contribute to it and any changes to it always happen in the open. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about, this was the process that Fedora Linux followed and Justin can tell you a little bit more about their unique experience, but I also hope that this will inspire some other uh, folks in the audience to submit their own solutions as digital public goods. You do that by nominating. You can also nominate on behalf of another project and we'll reach out to the project owner to follow up with them because ultimately someone with deep knowledge of the product uh, needs to answer these questions. Uh, it undergoes a technical review where we look at the documentation, the license they said they have, does it fit? And then if yes, they get recognition on the DPG registry, which is itself an open project. There's an open API, so that database can be pulled into uh, and is being used to underlie a bunch of other catalogs of digital solutions. So we think this is a great way, not only for projects to show their kind of alignment with the sustainable development goals and the commitments they're making around that, but also to increase their visibility. And as part of the Alliance, I mentioned earlier, we've got uh, the government of Norway, uh, the Indian think tank, iSpirit, the government of Sierra Leone and UNICEF, UNDP recently joined the governance as well as uh, the government of Germany. And our members include so many amazing organizations, including uh, GitHub, other UN agencies, like the UN Tech Envoy's office. Um, and we're adding kind of countries and uh, private and public sector organizations every day. So it's a really great way to get that kind of recognition. This is already out of date. We've got uh, 86 digital public goods registered, but I invite you to take a look at the registry as well. So I will stop. This is all kind of broad background and I'm sure you're really excited to hear about Fedora Linux's specific experience with this. So I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Justin. Thanks. So building on that, uh, I want to take us back to how this conversation started with Fedora. 
because one of the things that's uh, the, the very first requirement in the digital public goods standard is that piece on relevance to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Maybe you know about them already, maybe you don't, but these were a set of 17 goals that the United Nations defined in 2015 to uh, uh, across a range of areas to work towards by 2030. Um, and so we started this conversation with Fedora looking across these 17 different goals that cover a wide range of things from climate action to um, uh, zero hunger and quality education. Uh, but we looked more closely at one of these in specific, which is the goal number nine, which I'll drop a link here in the chat. But this one is all about, um, it's titled Industry, Innovation, and Infrastructure. So I want to hone in on that piece on infrastructure because so much of what we do, especially in these kinds of like Linux oriented communities or these places where we're building, uh, well, we're creating building blocks for other projects and other communities to build their own solutions on top of the tools and infrastructure that, that we're sharing. Um, we started to look more closely at that and we started a conversation in the Fedora Council about uh, exploring this opportunity for Fedora to be recognized as a digital public good through its relevance as critical digital infrastructure. So back in June, we had a presentation at the Fedora Council, which uh, is on the Fedora Project YouTube, I believe as well. Um, and that's how we started to frame this by thinking through what exactly do we mean when we're talking about resilient infrastructure and inclusive and sustainable industrialization. So a lot of times when we're thinking about infrastructure, we're thinking about it in a very physical sense. Roads, bridges, trains, cars, highways, cell towers, all these kinds of very physical things in our world. But maybe uh, maybe you already feel this way or maybe you don't, but you know, or you haven't thought of it this way, but you know, all these different ways that we set up our, our digital world today, we have all these different kinds of infrastructure and tools and platforms that help us build these new solutions. Uh, so we framed it by thinking, how can, uh, you know, knowing that our world is more and more interconnected, that this was a, a good moment to explore what digital infrastructure really means and to think of what examples uh, or to think more about what examples there are of digital infrastructure. So we use that to take a look back and think about, you know, almost the last 20 to 40 years of free and open source software and think about these key examples. Uh, and that was how we started this conversation of how Fedora could, could fit into this digital public good standard and how it could be recognized as a core piece of digital infrastructure. So that was how we started this conversation back in June. And in August, we worked together with the uh, Fedora project leader, Matthew, uh, and me to help put together uh, the first application or the first nomination for Fedora as a DPG. And just like Lucy explained a moment ago on the slides, there was the review process. We worked with together with uh, the Fedora project leadership and the Digital Public Goods Alliance to review you know, all these different parts of Fedora one of the things that I thought was really unique is uh, one of the questions in that process is understanding like where uh, the project is developed and where it was deployed, which uh, I think was really amazing that Matthew pulled all the uh, IP address logs from all the different package uh, mirrors and repositories and came up with something like 340 unique territories and countries of where Fedora is or where we're seeing hits on our different package repositories for uh, people that are using and running Fedora Linux. So, you know, this was how that conversation started. And it was through that review process in back in August that we, we had this conversation, went through with the Fedora Council. And at the end of it, in I believe it was uh, August, at the end of August, Fedora was officially certified as the first Linux distribution as a digital public good. Um, and there's some pieces, there's some, uh, oh, and I, I saw Ben just dropped a link to the Fedora Council meeting. So if you want to see that full recording of the uh, presentation, you can find it there from back in June. Um, but you know, this was kind of the story of how it happened. But, you know, and this is where um, I was really hoping Matthew could be here. So I'll try to 
speak as best as I can on, on his behalf on this piece. Um, but how does this connect Fedora Linux to the digital public goods? Or, or why does this matter for Fedora? So this was a long process that we are, or, um, sorry. So for Fedora, recognizing that this is a core piece of digital infrastructure, that was one part of it. But another thing that we really care a lot about in Fedora is also our community. We've always had, uh, if, you're, if you've been involved in the Fedora project, you might know about the four foundations. Freedom, friends, features, first. And behind all of those things, uh, Fedora has this very strong international community of hundreds, if not thousands of people spread across literally six continents. I mean, and if you know anyone in Antarctica, let us know, you know, that'd be a good one to, to add on the list too. But um, so this part was a really important piece behind, you know, what the Fedora project is trying to accomplish and, uh, and what we're trying to do with this work. So by going through this process and, and achieving the certification, it was an affirmation of Fedora's commitment to all these very critical things, both in terms of the standard, you know, all these different points that, you know, looking at things like, of course, the open source licenses and documentation, but also things like doing like do no harm in terms of how our community interacts and engages with each other. Things like our code of conduct and uh, the ways that we treat and interact with each other across our project. These are all pieces of the puzzle that fit together and made a compelling case for why Fedora uh, would be a good, was a good candidate and a good nominee for a a becoming a digital public good. Uh, so this was the point, um, you know, and I think uh, that link that, uh, that Lucy just put in the chat too, this is some of the reflection that uh, the team did as well, thinking about, um, so I think that's a, another good reference to look at in terms of the thinking and the motivation for why, why this was so important for Fedora and why we made it a commitment over those one to two months that we were working on the nomination to move ahead with this. Um, so the last thing that uh, I want to kind of wrap up with is thinking about, you know, next steps of how your own favorite open source projects or digital infrastructure projects could uh, become a digital public good. So I shared uh, the link to the uh, Sustainable Development Goals website. There's the 17 different goals that you can uh, look through and browse. I know we just had that keynote a little bit ago on OS climate, uh, which was a really interesting and compelling case of a, of a project working towards climate action with all these different key stakeholders. So this is a really excellent opportunity to start thinking more about what projects are we participating and working in and what ways can they impact uh, communities and, and other derivative or, or downstream projects in a way that we could, that you could pursue this option of, of going through this nomination process to become a digital public good. Um, so we're really keen to, uh, I know we're, I think we have five minutes left here for, for Q&A, so it was a really uh, quick peek. And don't forget to look at some of the polls in the polls tab on Hopin. We've been uh, feeding some of the uh, uh, some of the interaction po interactive polls there as well. But I think now from here, we can open it up for any questions there are. Oh, and actually, I think I see some here in, in the Q&A tab. Lucy, maybe uh, I'll read this one and maybe you can take this. This is from Harish. Uh, how would do no harm be enforced? Or if something is a digital public good and later it was deemed to be doing harm, does it exit DPG status? Great question. So, uh, did I turn my own? Yes, I'm not oh. muted. Wonderful. Uh, and good pointing out the Q&A tab. I was like, oh, we have no questions because I was looking at the chat, but here they all are. Wonderful. Um, so Do No Harm breaks down, as I mentioned, into three components. And the full title of Do No Harm is Do No Harm by Design. So we don't actually monitor whether a solution ends up doing harm down the road. We look at was it developed in a way that is likely to mitigate harm. So what we're looking at is kind of how they collect and store data, uh, how they ensure the privacy and security of the data they collect, uh, how they deal with, if they host content, how they deal with inappropriate and illegal content, and what their mechanisms are for detecting it or removing it, 
And then if they facilitate interactions between users, so whether that's part of a community or directly as part of the product, um, they have a mechanism to for people to protect themselves against grief, abuse, and harassment. And there's a way to address the safety and privacy of underage users. So that's all about how the product is designed. It's a little bit, uh, we're looking at kind of the hammer and we're like, does this hammer look like it's designed well and is it safe? People can use it uh, to do good or bad things. And that's where the standard doesn't go into how it's actually being implemented. We look at, was it designed in the best possible way for this? If at the point of review, they've got great privacy policies, um, they're doing a good job dealing with inappropriate content, and then down the road, uh, that falls away. So maybe they're not actually enforcing their privacy policy or they change it, or they said that they weren't you know, facilitating interactions and then they do, and we find out and people can report projects to us, it would be removed from the DPG registry and it would lose its DPG status if it no longer was designed and developed to do no harm. And I'm happy to have a go at the first question as well, though I think you would also probably have some thoughts on this. Um, so I think the primary benefit is recognition, but also visibility. And I say recognition, not just recognition for yourself, though, I think, or for the product, though I think it does feel good and is important to products, especially that are trying to do good in our open source to have this like global acknowledgement. But I think others acknowledge that as well. And so if your solution is one that's looking for adoption, is looking for funding, is looking for more people to engage with it, I think this puts you up along projects like Fedora Linux that have that recognition and are doing really good things. And we're seeing, and I'm seeing at least, um, a lot more recognition of the value of digital public goods generally. And I think with that, uh, like, oh my gosh, we've got so much digital digitization happening, it's very important that it's open source and that it was designed really thoughtfully. It's more important to also have that official recognition. So I see this as kind of a spiral upwards where it feels good for the project to be seen in that light, but that kind of status is also more broadly recognized by a community of people who are implementing, funding, and choosing projects that they want to support either as contributors or uh, as users. So. Uh, yes, it's about recognition, but I would say in a kind of a complicated uh, and excellent way. Yeah, and I think building on that too, there's also a connection to, you know, thinking about that DPG registry where all these projects are listed. This does tie into some other streams in parallel to this as well. So for me in, in the UNICEF Office of Innovation, one of the, the efforts that's going on there is the Giga, I think Giga Connect or just Giga, which is an effort to connect all the world's schools to the internet by 2030. A really ambitious goal. And uh, I'll put the link there in the chat. But the reason for this goal is so you think of it from this way of like, okay, great. So we're we're working with, with huge telecommunications providers and folks that are actually building infrastructure and, and developing it where there, there currently isn't great infrastructure or connectivity. So you invest in all of these things, you you, you create connectivity where there wasn't before. Now what happens? So this is one way that the DPG registry and that work ties into this puzzle of, at least with internet connectivity and one of these streams of work with the Giga project. So when we are, you know, schools are becoming connected to the internet for the first time and by extension, not just schools, but local communities as well. Digital public goods is one way to answer that question of how do you build a sustainable uh, infrastructure, uh, digital infrastructure in these places that haven't been done before. Uh, I know many good folks at Microsoft and uh, people that work there, but you know sometimes those tools can be a little frustrating to use, and of course, uh, many times they also aren't open source and lack a lot of the same values and core uh, pieces that we believe in that aren't there. So I, I think. I know we're, we're getting close to time here as I see the videos coming back up, but I think this is one of those other pieces here of you know, how this work ties into something bigger is it's providing more visibility and, and discoverability in these places that might not be our typical thing we think of from open source, like people using and creating open source tools and projects, but as more and more people become, on, become connected and get online, these kinds of things will become increasingly important. 
Okay, so I'm sorry, but we are actually out of time. This was great. Thank you, Lucy and Justin. And I know we have two more questions here. So I suggest that um, I think you can discuss these in the work adventure. I'm gonna post the, the link here in the chat. So you can go there, create your avatar and discuss this. Uh, I actually recommend it. It's a kind of a, a nice way to, uh, you know, that we try to sort of, uh, you know, make the venue a little bit more alive. So I think you can discuss the questions there. Thank you, Lucy and Justin, and uh, send our regards to, to Matthew. Thank you so much. Have a great DevConf. Yeah, thank you. Enjoy.